computer talk. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to the council members. Um, <clears throat> it is an absolute honor and privilege to be here with you all to speak on behalf of Rebecca Figueroa, my colleague, dear friend, and mentor to support her on this judicial nomination for the Boston Municipal Court. I first crossed paths with Rebecca when I was a judicial intern at the Roxbury Division of the Boston Municipal Court in 2010. It was a formative time for me and much of my time during that summer after my first year of law school uh, was spent observing attorneys for proceedings and assisting judges with research. Up until that point, much of what I knew about the law came from textbooks and the classroom. But as an aspiring prosecutor, the real learning was being done in the courtrooms of the Roxbury Division. One of the many pieces of advice that I repeatedly received, watch, listen, and learn. And that is precisely what I did. I absorbed it all. We often joke about this, but Rebecca mentored me before she even knew who I was. Um, while I was just starting out as an intern in a busy courthouse, Rebecca had been a practicing attorney for many years, and she immediately stood out to me. She was extremely knowledgeable of the law. She was confident, charismatic, respectful, and respected. Her reputation preceded itself. Yet it was her compassion and zealous advocacy that left the most lasting impression on me. She had an innate ability to genuinely connect with her clients, to humanize them and their circumstances, to arrive at a just resolution. And she did so ethically, responsibly, creatively, and compassionately. When I later joined the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office as a three to three student prosecutor and then an ADA in the same Roxbury Courthouse, Rebecca's mentorship continued, only this time she knew who I was. She exemplified integrity, empathy, and thoughtfulness in every case we handled together. Despite being in an adversarial system, we often shared the same outlook and goal and collaborated to achieve it. For example, in one instance, I recall Rebecca handling a series of cases that were difficult to manage. These cases involved a single defendant with upwards of 18 to 20 cases, all involving the same repetitive charges. This defendant was very well known to the court, to the practitioners that practiced there. However, he often defaulted but continued to amass these charges. Um, which ultimately, ultimately made it difficult to assign a steady attorney to his cases. When Rebecca was ultimately assigned, she was not deterred. Uh, despite the complexity and the defendant's trouble history, Rebecca approached the situation with patience and empathy, seeking to understand and address the underlying issues driving the behavior. Fast forward several years later, our paths crossed again when I joined the criminal clerk's office for Suffolk Superior Court in 2018. As a designated magistrate handling bail arguments, initial probation surrenders, pretrial conferences, warrant requests and removals and the like, and managing a busy trial session, I often witness firsthand Rebecca's calm demeanor, her professionalism and her fairness. She treats everyone from the courthouse parking attendants to judges, then business staff, pro se litigants, defendants, attorneys, and members of the public with dignity and respect. She's patient. She's very giving of her time. Rebecca has forged relationships with the younger members of our staff, many of whom are young women right out of college and working on their professional careers. Her office is nicknamed Rebecca's Cafe. Um, and it is a safe space that she created to allow the younger members to develop. Many of them, including Christina Rodriguez, is here today, um, has, has since moved on from the office and has advanced in her career, and that's largely because of Rebecca's guidance, patience, and her compassion. I am truly excited about Rebecca's nomination and what it means for the next generation of lawyers. Um, she's exactly what the bench needs and what the public deserves. I cannot wait to see her impact unfold in the Boston Municipal Courts. I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you on behalf of my friend and mentor. Thank you very much. At this point, uh... I would like to introduce the members of the council. To my left is Tara Jacobs. Next to her is, what's your name, sir? I'm kidding. Paul DiPaolo, Kevin's candidate, Eileen Duff. Nice to see you. And before we hear from you, I know you have a lot of family and friends. If you'd like to introduce them at this point, you can. My love of 30 years, my husband of 23 years, Sergeant Detective Eddie Figueroa. Um, my distinguished guests, my niece and nephew who were pulled out of class this morning, Giselle Figueroa and Lorenzo Figueroa, my beautiful mother, Ruthie Gomez, 
my friend and colleague, Christina Rodriguez from the Administrative Office of the Trial Court, my sister, my beautiful sister, Raquel, my best friend of 35 years, Delilah, my brother-in-law, Juan Figueroa. Thank you. At this point, we'll hear from you, and if you could tell us why you think you'd be a good addition uh, to the Associate Justice. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Councilor Ayanella and distinguished council members for your time here this morning and over the past weeks. I have truly enjoyed meeting and speaking with you all. Thank you to Governor Maura Healy for nominating me to be an Associate Justice of the Boston Municipal Court, a court that holds a very dear place in my heart. I am humbled and honored to be considered. Thank you to Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll and all of the members of the JNC. And I'd like to also thank Valerie McCarthy and her staff at the Governor's Council Office for shepherding me through this process. A special and heartfelt thank you to Chief Counsel Paige Scott Reed and Dara Kesselheim, Deputy Chief Counsel, for their guidance throughout this process. It has truly been an honor to meet and speak with you both. Thank you to Chief Justice Locke for being here today. It has been an enormous honor to appear before you as a practitioner and to work alongside you at Suffolk Superior Court. Thank you for the work that you initiated during your tenure and continue to do around issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and for including me, excuse me, and my perspective in these vital conversations within the trial court. My dear friend and colleague, Joanna Araujo, thank you for your beautiful words, your many years of friendship, and your unwavering support. I am taking this opportunity to thank my mentors, colleagues, and my friends for the support and encouragement they've offered me during the application process. Thank you to former Chief Justice of the BMC, Judge Robert Ronquillo, for your friendship and mentorship for the past 20 years. Thank you, First Justice of the Middlesex Juvenile Court, Gloria Tan, Superior Court Judges, Catherine Hom, Peter Krupp, who's here with us today, Deborah Squires Lee, Rosemary Connolly, Katie Rayburn, Mark Halau, and Anthony Campbell. District Court Judges Michelle Fentress and Asha White, Assistant District Attorney Migdalia Nalls, Attorney John Lozada from CPCS, and the Massachusetts Association of Hispanic Attorneys. You have all been a part of my village for this past year, encouraging me and preparing me. And I am eternally grateful for the time and effort you've invested into this endeavor. Thank you. I would not be here today were it not for the love and support of my beautiful family. To my family members and friends here today and those watching online, I love you all very much. And I thank you for your prayers and encouragement. As a Christian of profound faith, I want to thank God for all the blessings, excuse me, he has bestowed upon me and my family and for the tremendous blessing of being here today. <clears throat> I grew up in a large and tight-knit Christian family, and I was blessed to spend many of my formative years on my maternal grandparents' small and modest farm in Rio Grande, Puerto Rico. On that beautiful land that my family and I still call home, I learned the value of hard work and sacrifice. My grandfather, who was born and raised there, was early to rise, taking care of his beloved animals before dropping my brother and I off at school and heading to work at the municipal cemetery. Already in his 50s, he dug graves under the relentless Puerto Rico sun day after day. After a long work day, he would pick us up, we would head home, where he would spend the next few hours tending to our animals, helping a neighbor, or fixing things around the house, before finally settling in. <clears throat> My grandmother Elizabeth, may God rest her soul, was a homemaker. She loved gardening, growing her own vegetables, and an excellent cook. And she could feed an army at a moment's notice, which was good because our homes were always busy with family, friends, and neighbors. Despite not having much, my grandparents were always there to help a family member or a neighbor in need. It was not unusual for my grandmother to send my brother Richie or me down to a neighbor's house with a dozen of our homegrown eggs or a gallon of fresh milk that grandpa had drawn that morning. Under their guidance and love, I learned empathy, compassion, and the importance of being a good neighbor. In 1988, when I was 12 years old, my parents decided to relocate to Boston, where most of my parents' siblings had settled. My brother and I were enrolled at the Mary E. Curley Middle School in Jamaica Plain, and my younger sister was right down the road at the Agassiz Elementary School. Despite being conversational in English, I wasn't prepared for the culture shock that I would experience in school, and I longed to return to Puerto Rico. Around that same time, my mother's younger sister, Maggie, came to live with us. She was a third grade teacher at the Rafael Hernandez Elementary School in Roxbury, the first in our family to go to college and the best schoolest aunt you could ask for. I began spending lots of time with her. She was and always has been instrumental in my academic success. 
She started reading with me at night. At first she would read a page, then I would read a page, and we would go back and forth. As the months passed and my English skills strengthened, she introduced me to the diary of Anne Frank, to Kill a Mockingbird, and Black Boy by Richard Wright. Before I knew it, I had my very own Boston Library card, and I was doing well in school and slowly settling into our new life at Jamaica Plain. After middle school, I attended Boston Latin School, and during my first year, I was invited to visit Proctor Academy, a co-ed college preparatory boarding school in Andover, New Hampshire. My mother has always been deeply committed to my studies. However, the idea of sending me to a co-ed boarding school was not something she had ever imagined or considered. Despite her reservations, she took me to visit the school and allowed me to apply for admission. While my world was seemingly getting bigger, my father and my brother's while my world was seemingly getting bigger, my father and my brother's transition to the mainland was substantially more difficult. And as a family, we were living with a devastating reality of drug addiction. My mother was at crossroads. <clears throat> Excuse me. In those times, culturally, the idea of sending your young teenage daughter away for school was unheard of. However, she was aware of the toll that addiction has on each and every family member who experiences it. And she was determined to shelter me from that storm. She relied on her faith and on the support of our family and our close friends. And when I was admitted to Proctor Academy on an academic scholarship, she wrapped me up in prayer and encouraged me. Excuse me. My time at Proctor was extraordinary. My Proctor experience allowed me to see the world beyond the realities of my home life, to meet people from all walks of life, and to dream bigger than I had ever imagined. Before long, I settled into life at Proctor, but the realities of home were never too far away. While I was learning to play field hockey, helping to choreograph a play, and planning a semester abroad to Morocco, Addiction was ravaging my family. My mother visited me. I could see the pain in her eyes and the toll him. Excuse me. I would come home from school to find that things had gotten worse. There were many sleepless nights. I was worried about our beloveds. Every day, we prayed for the miracle of recovery. While living with the destructive results of addiction. In 1994, I graduated from Proctor Academy with honors. I attended Boston College where I met my beautiful husband. I graduated from Boston College in 1998 with a Bachelor of Sociology, and I went on to the New England School of Law. By all accounts, I had made it. I had set out to do everything I had planned. However, my academic success, excuse me, however, despite my academic success, the truth is that addiction is a vicious cycle, not only for the user, but for the families as well, and my family was no different. We would have months of sobriety and a sense of normalcy would set in, only for there to be a relapse in weeks, if not months, of nonstop worry for the safety of our loved ones and for the safety of others. Following my second year of law school, I interned at the Committee for Public Council Services, and I spent the summer at the Dorchester Division of the BMC, conducting arraignments, pretrial hearings, and probation surrenders. I loved being in court, and by all accounts, I was a natural. Experiences that already taught me about many of the issues that my clients were facing substance abuse, homelessness, mental health issues, and involvement with the criminal justice system. I knew how to talk to defendants. I knew how to connect with their families. And most importantly, I knew how to advocate for them in court because these issues were not foreign to me. I too had sat in the audience of the different divisions of the Boston Municipal Court as a family member. I knew the pain and the anguish that a family feels when a loved one is arrested and arraigned. And I knew the fear in the eyes of families who were before the court seeing a section Section 35 commitment because I had been there with my mother out of options and asking the court to intervene. My desire to be a judge is deeply rooted in my commitment to serving my community and ensuring equal access to justice for those we serve. I have been an attorney for 21 years and I believe that I bring the required discipline, temperament, and legal acumen to be a fair and impartial judge. My professional and personal life experiences have given me the independence, the communication skills, and the mental and emotional fortitude to serve as a judge. I have dedicated my entire professional career to serving individuals and families in crisis. And in doing so, I have learned to be patient, empathetic, and mindful, not only of extenuating circumstances, but of collateral consequences as well. The Boston, the Boston Municipal Court, excuse me, is not only a community court, it is my home court. It is where I became an attorney. I practiced there as a student, as a public defender, and as a bar advocate. 
I am deeply familiar with and invested in the extraordinary work done in the different divisions daily for the people that it serves. I know with utter certainty that any person who is elevated to the bench that judge the deeds of another person must take the full measure and account of the human being before the court. And I pledge to do just that and to continue to follow the number one rule my mother instilled in my siblings and I from a very young age to treat others as I want to be treated. I would be honored to continue serving the city of Boston and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as an associate justice of the Boston Municipal Court. Thank you and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, Councilor Marilyn Petito Devaney has joined the uh, hearing. Uh, I just wanted to say I apologize. I would stop the car. I had to get AAA. My battery was dead. So I didn't even think I'd get here this time. So I apologize. I apologize. It doesn't happen. <laughs> so sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, your testimony was very compelling. Uh, you did a great job. At this point, we'll hear from Councillor Eileen Duff. Thank you. Uh, thank you, attorney, for applying for the bench. Um, I think you're a great applicant. I really enjoyed our, our lengthy conversation together. Um, I'm not going to ask you about addiction. I know you know all about that. I do want to say um, I think your mother is quite heroic for uh, taking you and putting you uh, in, in a safe place. And we are seeing that today with many mothers that are bringing their children to this country to keep them safe. And it really, to me, the parallel to that was remarkable to me. So thank you. That's it's to let your child into the custody of somebody else is. Amazing, so thank you for that. And <laughs> you're certainly welcome. You don't need to thank me. But um, the, the one thing that I, I do want to review with you. Uh, your experience uh, working with folks in the LGBTQ community. Um, I'm sure with your years in this court, you know, one of the people's courts you've, ex you've worked with this community. Um, I've talked about this a lot. Uh, I understand some folks don't get these issues. I understand some people have a really hard time, particularly with the transgender thing, but we are the adults. We are the elected officials, and it is our job to make sure people are safe and protected. It doesn't absolve you from committing a crime. You committed a crime. But, uh, you know, making sure those folks are safe while in custody or while incarcerated is very important. Um, so can you expound a little bit on your experience with that community, if you have any? Yes, um, I have had the... the privilege of representing um, defendants um, for the last, well, when I was in private practice, um, all walks of life and certainly um, individuals who um, identified as a member of the LGBT community. It was always of utmost importance to me to make sure that they were safe if they were being held in custody. And I would make sure to have the court, um, I would make sure to talk to my client about where they felt the safest, safest um, especially back when it was less talked about. And I would make sure to advise the court of that and make sure that that message or our concern was relayed to the sheriff's office or wherever they were going to be held. As part of any marginalized community, I understand that growing up, um, you know, I think today we're having more conversations about it, but that wasn't true 15 years ago. And I think that we need to be mindful of those struggles. They're very similar. Um, to addiction and that there can be, uh, some, there can be guilt or shame surrounding it. Dispel that and make them feel welcome in every setting. Um, I agree that it does not absolve them um, um, responsibility for any acts they may have committed, but it's certainly something that I would take into account when I am evaluating a person and when I'm evaluating what a, a just sentence would be or a good disposition for a case. Mm -hmm. I am an ally and um, and I will always be. Thank you. On the outside. Thank you. I think. A tremendous job right now. I think our chiefs and all the courts are, are, are doing their best to educate and to learn about about this pronouns. I mean, I, I can't even keep up with the acronyms sometimes and I'm part of the community. It's a lot. Um, but the reason why particularly the youth are in front of a judge often have to do with the fact that they have been rejected by their families. They don't feel safe in a foster home. And so they're living on the street. Limited opportunities, which often turns into addiction and 
you know, shoplifting, a thief, you know, crimes of that sort, and homelessness. And um, we can do better for, for, for this community, but for our whole country and for all the youth. Um, we don't need to have children living on the streets and committing crimes and committing sex crimes because that's the only way they get a place to sleep. It's to me just unacceptable. Um, so thank you for your commitment to that. I know you're committed to the other issues we are shared joint concerns about as well. Um, love your background. Um, I'm a big fan of CPCS and I love seeing you, but you really have a, a, a great trajectory um, onto the bench. So I appreciate your application because it takes a lot just to throw your name in the hat. So thank you. Thank That's you all. very much, uh, Councillor. Councillor uh, Terry Kennedy. I have a client who's in jail right now, who's uh, locked up the other day. You know why he was locked up? He was on probation. He failed a scram, a breath test. Someone who has an alcohol problem, no question. But should anybody that go to jail for simply failing a scram? I think it's a difficult question to answer. Just I don't think it's a difficult question. Well, because I think we need to, I, I would need to know the criminal history, what the background is, how many times, if any, um, that person has been before the court. But in short, I do not think so. I think. Very familiar with addiction, as you indicated, and people who struggle with alcohol and drugs basically can't help themselves. That guy blew a point on two on the screen. Okay. Um, second violation. Well, and, and the case for which he was uh, put on probation was not uh, an alcohol related offense. I think that's important too, but the judge saw that alcohol was an issue. Um, I just can't imagine any scenario where a judge should send anybody to jail failing a scram. They're addicts, they can't help it. This guy knew the consequences. He, he knew that he could potentially go to jail. He knows he has to take the breath test. Obviously, he can't help himself, right? Are you going to send somebody? We recognize it's an illness. Absolutely. You're going to send somebody to jail for pointing a scram when they're on probation? Ever? That would not be my first um, inclination. Or is it your second? Well, I, again, it would be based on the facts. The facts that you've presented would not on its face present enough for me to say that that person deserves to be incarcerated. I understand addiction and I understand that you can have years of sobriety. How does, how does, it, how does sending someone to jail help with addiction? Well, again, I, 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 I'm just I'm, I'm contrasting that with a person who perhaps has had a very long history and perhaps some driving infractions having to do with consider that all. But in this uh, uh, scenario that you've presented, I would absolutely work with the probation department, see how far, if it's a single relapse. What you're saying they want him detained. It's a second violation. That's why he's detained. They didn't say he wanted to. He wouldn't be. I would look at everything. He's probably getting out Friday, but that's not the point. I, would, I think I would look at the entire um, picture. How long has he been sober? Is this a relapse um, after months of sobriety? Is something else going on? Um, how can we help him get back on? Two fails in two years. Well, that, that matters because that means that he was able to sustain his sobriety. Well, for let's say it was five fails in two years. What, how, what does jail do? I don't think the jail does anything, but unfortunately, we have so such a shortage of beds and resources for addicts that. Is he tell them to stay home? That, that may be. Like your bed. That may be an option. Yes, they stay home. It's important. Why, why are we sending people to jail for being addicts? And we do. We, absolutely, it happens every day in our courts. I don't agree with it, but I think that absent more resources, it's it's unfortunate. Let's forget about resources. We're talking about sending somebody. With what we recognize is an illness, addiction. Why are we ever sending somebody for jail because they're an addict or an alcoholic? That's in a public safety concern, excluding that. You know, if somebody's got six driving others and they're drinking, you might want to lock them up as a public safety measure. But even then, I look to other alternatives. Take that away. You ever send an addict to jail just because they, they flunk a, a urine test or a scram? Is there absent a new offense or a danger to the community? That would not be something that I would ever consider. 
I would work with, like I said, the resources that we have within the courthouse, the resources that I fostered when I was practicing to try to find a, play, a way to get that person back on track. I understand that addiction is sometimes minute to minute for the addict. And if I can be a bridge to help them get back on board, that is my first priority. So absent any other, uh, like I said, a new offense or any public safety, I agree with you that we should not be um, using our jails to house them, but instead we should be putting resources in place. For a short time. Liberty is a big deal. I agree with you. Huge deal. I'm in agreement with you. One of the things that happens to people that are uh, heavily involved in the court system is they almost become callous to the fact that so what they're in jail for a few days. It's not uh, that big a deal. You know what I mean? It is. Um, also, uh, my friend, my good friend, Council Ionella, and a big supporter of yours, is uh, uh, absolutely 100% behind your nomination. He was twisting my arm earlier. Um, always brings up this scenario, and I'm bringing it up. I'm stealing it from him because it recently happened to me, as he knows. Got a case that's getting kind of old. Some of my cases might get a little old here and there. Judge Block is laughing because that probably was <laughs> half of the backlog in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But um, it's only because I'm busy. I'm not, I'm not avoiding cases. But the um, got a case that's I've been off for trial a couple of times. And um, it's coming up again for another trial day. And the lawyer has an opportunity to go on vacation five, six days. They come in. I need to move this case. I'm going on vacation. My wife wants to go away for a few days. And um, the DA stands up and says, Judge, this is the third time. We're objecting. What are you going to do? I'm a solo practitioner for a very long time. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm married to a sergeant detective. So I understand tight schedules. And that happened to me very recently. The judge said, no. I think that um, having been in the trial court, I was more than upset. Of course. The first person I called was Counsel Ionella because he brought that example up every single yeah. week after week after week after week. <laughs> I had to reconsider, but when I got that fax on 4 30 on a Friday, I was pretty upset because I don't think that should happen to any lawyer. I don't interfere with people's vacations. So it's a police, they tell me the police officer is going to be on vacation, they tell me the DA is going to be on vacation. They tell me somebody's sick. You never hear a peep out of me. You know, I don't interfere with people's personal lives. And I think we have to keep in mind when you're looking at the words that are in front of you and when you're looking at uh, uh, whether it's a prosecutor or a defense lawyer or a, or a witness, a police officer, witness or otherwise, we don't interfere with people's personal lives. The, I agree, counsel. The, the case isn't going to get reached. And I think that the judges who are here in support of me today both Krupp and Judge um, Locke, I've worked with them extensively over the last seven years when they sit criminally in Suffolk. And I think they would attest to the fact that I am very familiar with most practitioners and I advocate for them. I am often in the lobby saying so-and-so is seeking a continuance judge and I think we should do it because of this X, Y, and Z. As I told you, your, uh, your counsel is a big supporter. Um, judge Locke, I've known for a couple of centuries. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say that he had to retire at 70 and I knew his father. Um, the, um, when he was up here, he's a great man. Um, I told you that Judge Ham called me last night and that's the only time she has ever called me since she first got on the bench and she's somebody I have a lot of respect for. Um, so uh, I'll be voting for you next week. I think you're going to be a terrific judge. Thank you very much, Counselor. Thank you. The week after or the week after, depending on Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilor Rod DePaulo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to pick up on a couple of things Councilor Kennedy was, was speaking with you about. Um, in Worcester, where I'm from, I think our DA is committed to addressing substance abuse, and I think he does an overall a really good job. Not everyone, though, in the, in the system has the same level of commitment. Um, so, for example, <clears throat> Uh, it's my understanding that medically assisted treatment that is statutorily mandated isn't always happening in our county house of corrections. Um, the other concern that is there to me a lot 
is that folks <clears throat> are incarcerated and if they're not getting the treatment, again, that's statutorily mandated, but even if it wasn't, I think sheriffs have some discretion in how they run their facilities. Um, that folks leave incarceration having been cold turkey, and that's where we see a lot of overdoses and deaths, unfortunately, right? Because they're coming out without the tolerance they had when they were using prior. And I just raised both of those to ask, are those phenomenons that you see either in your experience or otherwise in the Commonwealth? And if so, how does it, how do you think it informs the kind of judge you're going to be? So when I was in private practice, I can say that, yes, I saw that very often, particularly with defendants who were held for shorter periods of time and were then released. When I was crafting a disposition as a defense attorney, and I knew that the person was a substance or, or suffered from substance use disorder, I always tried to incorporate into the probationary period, if there was one, some services. And I would do so by drafting um, pre-sentencing reports or a sentencing memorandum for the judge explaining the level of addiction. And I would also spend a lot of time with my client trying to figure out if they had ever received any kind of services. I was always very struck by the fact that many, many addicts who've been on the street and have and suffered from this for a very long time have never had a substantial treatment have gone into detoxes or holdings and have maybe gone to a program for a month. But we all know that this is something that affects their mental health and every other aspect of their life. And so we need more comprehensive programming for them. So again, in the Suffolk Superior Court, where people are sentenced to many, many years and this department of um, we don't have a lot of follow up unless they're then on probation and come to us. But I think that I know that when I, I will continue the work that I did as about what happens in this, because if we really want them to reintegrate and, and be able to participate and, and succeed once they are released from custody, which should be our goal. We can't do that without providing some sort of services and some sort of programming. And so I look forward to thinking about making those considerations as I am thinking about a disposition on a case and working with the resources that we have in the court and working with community resources. I think the probation department, we're having a lot of training around this as of late. And I think there are some very, very dedicated probation officers. Uh, for example, at Suffolk Superior Court, Maurice Greaves is someone who thinks this like this and thinks long term and wants to talk about what happens next. And so I would continue using those services and, and make that a very important and, and a factor in my consideration of sentencing. I appreciate your thoughtfulness on that. And I think I see a lot of good things happening with probation and, and moving in the right direction. Um, you mentioned um, as a practitioner um, sentencing memoranda that you would submit. Uh, in your is our sentencing memoranda always submitted by counsel? Not always, not always. And, and I ask because um, uh, in your application, uh, when asked about how to exercise your discretion, you referenced a few things. One of them was the sentencing guidelines, um, and that's a useful frame of reference, I think. Um, and the sentencing guidelines, um, you know, indicate that. There doesn't need to be an evidentiary hearing around mitigating or aggravating circumstances, but implicitly there there could be, right? And so, uh, since you're sensitive to a lot of the factors of substance abuse and trauma um, that might play into someone's experience that got them before you as a judge, um, number one, um, would you ever ask for sentencing memoranda? Would you hold uh, a hearing, evidentiary hearing to get more information regarding um, potentially mitigating circumstances for an individual. And I guess I asked that against the reality that resources and time are tight, uh, the pace of, of life in BMC, I imagine. Um, so would, would, would you ever seek that out because you don't feel you have enough info? Absolutely. And I think that sentencing is probably the most important role that a judge plays. And I don't see any urgency in getting that done where we skip any, any parts of getting to know the defendant and the circumstances behind his or her presence before the court. And so I would absolutely ask, and I can say that having been a member of the defense bar and having been in this capacity for the past seven years, we have extraordinary attorneys who are very dedicated to the work that they do. 
I've never in all of my years had an attorney say, I'm not going to put something together. If a judge gives you an opportunity, my experience has been that attorneys really take great care to um, either do it themselves, which is what I did. I would spend a lot of time at the jails or at the House of Correction. I would visit my clients' families and get to know them. But attorneys often seek the help of social workers or other resources. Um, you know, we, we, I've seen judges allow them time to get mental health records so they can incorporate that. I think it's absolutely important to have all of the circumstances before you before making a decision. And I would encourage every if, if I'm ever at a crossroads or I'm ever thinking about something and I know that there's more to the story and I don't have it, I'm going to ask for a sentencing memorandum. Absolutely. I like that response um, in the in the uh, report from the sentencing commission. One of the things they mentioned, and I'll just read it rather than paraphrase, that some aspects of the sentencing of emerging adults, individuals up to and including age 21 should be considered when sentencing such individuals, even if the individuals are subject to this jurisdiction of the adult. Uh, and this is in line with the way the courts have embraced uh, the science around brain development that we know. The sentencing guidelines themselves uh, list the age of the defendant at the time of the offense as a mitigating factor, as well as mental or physical conditions that significantly reduce uh, their culpability for the for the offense. And I would lump a mental and physical conditions because it's a it's a physical condition. Um, beyond the science that the SJC has addressed, we also know that childhood trauma further delays brain development and the things about brain development that that might be mitigating in, in an individual's case. Um, what's your view on um, emerging adults, I would label that up to age 25. The SJC currently has it at about 20, um, although they left open the fact that they only were looking up to 20. And so there's the possibility that we may see that expanded. What's your view on that as far as uh, how you'd approach your role, especially in sentencing? Well, I welcome the SJC's recent decision, and I am happy that we are considering the science and the fact that all of those factors that you mentioned are, in fact, uh, go into uh, consideration when you're talking about this age group. Um, I can tell you that one of my first cases when I was appointed as a assistant clerk magistrate was with Judge Peter Krupp behind me. We had a triple homicide and they were all young men. And I think it maybe was my first case as an assistant clerk. And I remember that during sentencing, the attorneys, uh, and this was years ago, seven years ago, I want to say, went out of their way and submitted really powerful and substantial pre-sentencing memorandums talking about these issues. And I was very um, struck by the enormity of having to pronounce in court that you are now committed for and during the term of your natural life to a 19 year old. Because I understand that at that age, with all of the trauma that they may have experienced, and I'm not talking, I think people think trauma and they think something super significant and all of that, but I'm talking basic needs. Yeah going to school, having a parent, having breakfast, having food on your table, having home security. Those are the things that slowly but surely affect you as you grow up. And I can't imagine that at 19 years old, if you have none of those pillars set up for you, that you would not succumb to peer pressure and you would not succumb to making impulsive decisions. And so I welcome and I applaud it and I, I, I will follow in the footsteps of the judges who sit behind me and the judges who serve currently on the BMC in exploring and um, doing everything we can to uh, continue to think about emerging adults and what factors to consider when we are um, sentencing them or considering a sentence. But I think we're moving in the right direction and um, and I'm hopeful that, that, that we'll be able to uh, offer them services while they're inside. So if in fact they are ever paroled, they can contribute and come back and, and perhaps start life again. Thank you for that. And I would add, poverty as a, as a trauma um, and, and even in some cases, unfortunately, school, uh, how, how their education is, is handled. A, a last question I have for you, um, uh, because it's, it's something that happens uh, in the Worcester County Bar Association too. You're part of the CPCS Strategic Planning Committee on Anti-Racism. I was. Um, could you share what the results of that were or what what you've seen implemented or what recommendations were made from that? So unfortunately, as soon as we submitted our report, not unfortunately, but unfortunately I wasn't able to follow up with it because I was appointed an assistant clerk magistrate, but I was very honored to be invited. I was the only bar advocate that was invited to participate on that panel. We drove out to Worcester actually for, I wanna say three months, um, once a week to meet and we put together 
Um, what we really wanted to concentrate on was uh, staffing at the Committee for Public Council Services and making sure that not just the line attorneys or the staff attorneys like I was, but that the administration also reflected the communities that we served. And we wanted that to be true in the bar advocate programs as well. Um, I know that we put through a robust a, um, proposal, and I know that we um, suggested that they hire someone just to deal with these issues. My understanding is that that, in fact, did happen. Um, I'm excited when I look at the makeup of the administration of CPCS now. I know that uh, my good friend Arnie Stewart and Vanessa Velez, who was just before you recently, were um, part of their administrative body, and I think that they're doing tremendous work to advance, um, like I said, not only um, the staff attorneys resembling the communities that they serve, but also those making the decisions. Thank you for that. And I know in Worcester, there's people doing work. We need to recruit and cultivate uh, attorneys of color, attract attorneys of color to Worcester um, and, and create a pipeline of judicial uh, applicants like yourself. Uh, I really appreciate your story. I think it's uh, I think it's powerful for attorneys out there um, who can envision themselves as judges. Um, and uh, last question, Rafael Hernandez Elementary, you did moot court there. Is that the same elementary school you mentioned that your aunt taught at? Yes, it wasn't her class, but um, we had a law day at Roxbury Court. It was one of the best days I've ever had in court. We had fifth graders come in. Um, I served as the judge. They were uh, prosecutors and defense attorneys. We gave them a simple fact pattern. It was such a good day. Every single person from the court found themselves in the courtroom. Judges who weren't on the bench just came in to see what, what was going on. It was an extraordinary experience. Thank you for that. I hope you continue to find opportunities to address the youth. I was at Blackstone uh, Innovation School for a year, which is nearby. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I appreciate the work you're doing there. I have no further questions. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll hear from Councilor Tara Jacobs. Good to see you. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> first off, I want to echo that you have quite the champion in your counselor and uh, it's advocated strongly on your behalf. Um, we had a great conversation last night and I really appreciated all that you shared personal and professional points of view and got to know you. I feel uh, very well and in a way that really makes me so happy that you've been nominated um, for so many reasons. I don't have a lot of questions for you today, but before I pass it off, um, there's so many different, you know what, your witness mentioned how you created a safe space in your office for you know, mentoring those uh, staff members who needed a safe space. and. That, I, a, I appreciate that you're that kind of person in terms of just the culture of courtroom that you might create within that's your nature. But I wanted to reflect back to you some things I've heard and get your perspective on it. Um, and for me, these are Western Mass things that I'm hearing. So I, I assume it is probably shared across the state, but I can't speak specifically be what I've heard locally for me. But I've I've gotten feedback about um, you know a real desire to increase the safe space of the court for victims, for defendants, for those who have been impacted by trauma, violence, you know, in, in all the different ways, and a real reflection of concerns that people are being re-traumatized in in the court through disrespect or. Um, in various ways, um, and so I, I wanted to put it to you to sort of think through how, as as a judge in your courtroom, you might be able to enhance the safe space of that experience if you can. Sure. So I I, I don't think there's any room for that towards anyone. Not our colleagues. Not our court staff. It's certainly not to the folks that come into our courtrooms seeking some sort of resolution or defendants, their families, and much less victims. I think the judge sets the tone for the courtroom. I think the judge demands decorum and gives the respect and empathy that is expected back. I have had the privilege. I feel like I've been in a, a boot camp, judge boot camp at Suffolk Superior Court. I've had the privilege of working with such distinguished and respected judges, and I have slowly but surely absorbed all of the things that have made sense to me that I see that work with people. Um, I um, 
I will bleed with respect and dignity towards everyone, regardless of what you're accused of, regardless of what brings you before the court. Um, I understand that we see people in crisis. We don't see people at their best. And so you have to meet them where they're at. And that means diffusing the situation, not making it worse, addressing them in a tone that is compassionate, addressing them in language that they understand, because sometimes we get into our legalese and folks don't understand that. And so um, taking a moment to understand where this person at, is at in this moment when they're for you, giving them time if they're not ready. So I've had plenty of judges adjourn and say, we're gonna give this a second call to kind of calm everything down. Um, it is their day in court and they deserve to be heard. And I find that regardless of the outcome, even if I set a bail when I'm sitting as the magistrate, if I do it with a tone of respect and compassion and understanding of what brings them before the court, it does not matter the outcome. It does not matter what I order. They feel like they've been heard. And um, that's something that I do in my personal life. I do with my colleagues. And it's something that I certainly will bring into my courtroom as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. So I have one more. Um, so we talked last night about the each court is one I brought up as an example, but I think it's an example of, of other things going on. And just to say it here, so it's people don't know what we're talking about, but um, in Springfield, there's a court called each EACH and it's emerging adult court of hope. And it's a, it's a special diversionary court program. That's that was initiated by a superior court judge with um, support from the DA with support from local um, nonprofit um, like wraparound service type of an entity and designed to really set people back on emerging adults specifically who you know have to qualify. There's there's some charges that they won't qualify, but if they qualify, um, set them on a path for success with you know an assessment of what they need and, and put those things in place with very strict lifestyle guidelines like curfews and who they can interact with and what have you, but they've been successful in um, get education and skill set and substance abuse, mental health, all the things that one might need to really set themselves on a path. And if they can stay clean for five years, they will wipe their record clean, which is an amazing opportunity for someone who in their teenage years maybe got caught up in, in uh, some destructive behaviors. And I say all of that just to ask you, um, you know, judges do have some discretion in being able to be creative and thinking about things like that. I've heard of other other examples across the state. And so I wanted to hear from you what your thoughts were about a those kinds of programs uh, just on their face, but also if you were given the opportunity, if you had the opportunity to, to do something yeah. similar, you know, what would be your Focus. What would be your your you know what? How do you see that you could you know potentially down the line contribute something like that to our our system? So I'm a big proponent of the specialty courts. I think that even if we reach one or two dependents and we're able to make a change and and the, and the structure that we put in place for them is successful, then we've succeeded. Um, I was very impressed by the program that you described yesterday. <laughs> Um, I've not seen something like that here in Suffolk County, but I can tell you that when I was in the drugs and Judge Locke um, referred to in his statement, I did work with uh, the Honorable Judge Robert Tochka, who's now retired, and he had come from the Boston Municipal Court. I had appeared before him for years. There he had um, worked extensively on programs such as the Choice Program, which is something similar in the Roxbury Division, which is young men and women, um, identifying them, putting really, um, as you said, some restrictions around um, their their uh, probation period, but also bring them services. And ultimately, um, we had graduates from the program that went on to uh, not reoffend and were able to gain employment and um, feel good about themselves and, and make a difference. And so I look forward to working with my colleagues if I am confirmed with Boston Municipal Court. Um, I, I think that, you know, I would, I would obviously look at more into that program. I think emerging adults need these resources, particularly if we are um, wanting them to rejoin and uh, have a second chance at life. And so anything that we can do with our community resources and within the court um, to uh, help them along the way. I am very proponent on that, and I'm very much looking forward to being a part of those conversations. I, I appreciate that. I, I very much hope that you do become confirmed, and I'd love to come visit you. Uh, I, it, 
the BMC is one of the few courts I haven't visited yet and want to learn more about, and I, I think it would be phenomenal to do that at, well, talking you at work. So thank you. thank you for all the time you gave last night, and, um, and thanks for answering my Thank question. you. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor uh, Jacobs. Next, we'll hear from uh, Councillor Joseph Ferrara. Thank you. Thank you for reaching out to me. You do have a bad, diverse experience, real estate, civil, 50%. Um, in the criminal session, and you're one of the few people that I've seen that can actually say they sat through 75 jury trials. That's amazing. Um, Looking for the case. <laughs> <laughs> About time in courtroom 817. Yeah. Besides your credentials, there are two other reasons I want to vote for you. One is to my left, uh, Chris, Chris I know is a big fan of yours, but uh, the fact that you got the Chief Justice of the trial court to be here, who I have. The utmost, utmost respect for us speaks volumes, volumes, because we hardly ever see him. Uh, he's, uh, he's an icon in Massachusetts judiciary. And uh, if he's here for you, that, that means you're a rock star for sure. So we have my support. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Next, we'll hear from Councillor Marilyn Petito. Thank you for coming out and all the time that you afforded me. It was such a mix up. I, I was presented with four new. Yes. nominees and you hadn't even been scheduled yet i mean everything's amazing but thank you for all the time it was really a pleasure to meet with you um i'm not going to go over your um back to your family and the custody i, I only because i cried when i met with you and i'm not going to cry now but i have to say that um i wish there were more people here about their families well look at the result you know but um, I, I wanted to ask you about um, when you were in private practice, um, how many cases and trials did you have? I had hundreds of, of cases. Um, I practiced in the Roxbury, Dorchester, and East Boston divisions as a bar advocate. Um, as a public defender, I took cases out of Roxbury and followed the indictment process up to Suffolk State Resort. Um, I've resolved hundreds of cases. I have four re trials that really stick out for me that were significant. Um, when you're in the district court, you just you, you handle so many cases, and and um, probably that would be the most. Those would be the most significant ones, the ones I've listed on my application. But I have represented hundreds and hundreds of. Decision to. So I had been in private practice, I want to say at that time, maybe 13 years, and um, it really wasn't, um, I, I love the practice, um, I just wanted some, I, I, I wanted to grow it, I wanted to do something different, and I knew Suffolk Superior Court would afford me that opportunity. I missed being in that court, um, I missed the uh, complexity of those cases, and I missed the complexity of the arguments, and uh, I wanted to work with these judges specifically, and I was very blessed to be appointed um, as an assistant quick magistrate, and it really has been. Well, this is a tribute that you have these judges here for you today. And I will tell you, I had the honor of presiding over Justice One. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> that's quite a memory we keep going back. <laughs> we won't get into it. <laughs> but uh, I was very honored. No, I, um, I, I'm very impressed with your background. What I want to ask you is, though, you talk about all your duties as um, a certain magistrate doing while you're doing that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So you were the assistant clerk magistrate. Is that oh. Yeah. So what is the clerk magistrate doing while you're doing all this work? <laughs> I, I just wanna I just wanna separate because I mean I've heard it for 25 years, but now I want to know with this because you have quite a lot of well, our office is a very, very busy office. We run the uh, busiest homicide session in the state. And so um she is responsible for making sure that you know her staff is up to date with uh, the latest requirements and uh, uh, for example something just sealing expunge or sealing uh, not guilties or um, acquittals and so um, I guess shepherding us through our day and making sure that we so do you work together or do you have your assignments and, and you no, we're very independent she runs a very independent office we are assigned to a trial session or to the magistrate session. Um, some of my colleagues are in the first session, which is kind of like where everything gets 
sent out. And so we work very independently um, with our judges. So really our relationships are very close um, just the judge and the assistant clerk. I've been very fortunate, like I said, to spend a considerable amount of time, not just with Chief Justice Locke, but with Judge Peter Krupp and other very distinguished judges in the Superior Court. No, you have. It's wonderful. Um, it, it, some serious crimes. Uh, you know, um, when you talk about someone in Big Brother, and how do we, how do they get these people to get into Big Brother when they would do that to a four year old and, and ruin their life? Ruin their life. Because I have a friend whose child was in a um, daycare, you know, and um, she was abused. And she never got over that. She was engaged twice. Beautiful girl. And uh, so I know, you know, Christian, it, it, it's not something that they can get over. So, but what I want to know is, because it's not in your, um, in your resume, uh, what was the sentence for that person? That person, so she, you're referring to a case that I referenced in my uh, application. It um, involved a small, I said a four year old girl who was left, um, who had an older brother who had a, uh, someone assigned him to do the Big Brother Association. And that person, <laughs> until she was 16 years old. My, if I recall correctly, the sentence I want to say um, was upwards of 30 years. Um, I don't, I don't know what is enough to me like, you know, um, uh, I go out in the prisons and I, I meet with these inmates and uh, I, I'm sure you will hear this is talk. There's racial discrimination in the courts. There's no question. System. And um, I met with this 33 years. He's been in prison since he was 20. He wasn't even in the room when his friend murdered someone in another part of the house and he was sentenced life in prison without parole. Where's the justice? And, you know, I, I, I want to identify these people that deserve release. And I've got a wonderful governor that I'm patenting with because it wasn't like that with the last governor. So we're going to do that. But it just seems like um, there has to be some way these organizations know the people who are going to be working with children. It's going to be a stronger um, vetting process, I think. Um, so um, what would a lot of serious cases, what is the most serious that you've had? That you, you, something that you'll always remember? I don't know how you got through it, but I'm sure you have more than one, but one that stands out. I think, uh, well, like I said, I've handled lots of different cases from sexual abuse on children to things like that. I think the most impactful case for me was when I represented a young man out of the Roxbury division who'd had a very um, long um, and substantial criminal history, but also had a very long and substantial life of trauma and neglect and drug use. And um, it was hard to fashion a, I knew um, almost immediately that we would have to resolve the case short of trial. The, the evidence was there, the facts were against him. He had led, he was alleged that he had led police on a high speed, uh, I don't want to call it chase, but uh, so he was driving recklessly throughout the Delhi Square area. And so um, in looking to resolve it, what was most impactful for me was that I visited him at the jail and I remember, and I'll never forget this, that he had a very large scar on his head and um, I asked him about it. And he said to me, you're the first attorney to ever ask me. And he went on to tell me that when he was two years old, he went on to tell me that he was born to a mother who was um, addicted to opioids. And when he was two or three years old, he was um, in the um, Upham's corner area with them. She was under the influence. She let go of his hand. He walked into the street. He got hit by a car, suffered substantial head injuries, then went into foster care for quite some time, was never back reunited with her, and began using at a very, very young age. And I was very impacted by the fact that he had had this extensive criminal history, but that no one had ever taken the time to actually speak to him. And so in resolving the matter, um, I you know, was uh, very fortunate to work with a very um, dedicated uh, now U.S. Attorney Elizabeth Riley, a DA at the time in Roxbury Court. And, um, you know, rightfully so, she was very concerned about the safety issues of the facts and about his criminal history. But when we got to talking about his 
own story. It was very impactful, not just for her, but for the judges, for the judge that heard us at the BMC. And I find this to be true for many of the judges that I've had the pleasure of appearing before and that I work with now, is that um, they take the time to look at the individual. And so I'm very, I will never forget him. I wish I kept in touch with him. It was hard to do once I took this position, but I will say that he had spent a considerable amount of time in custody prior to resolving the case. So we did a split sentence where that was considered the commit, committed portion of it. We did a significant amount of probation. Um, I think it was three years with a significant amount of programming. A few years later, I was a duty attorney in Roxbury and a friend and I were walking to the Dunkin' Donuts in Dudley Square to get a nice coffee. And I hear, that's my attorney, that's my attorney. And then Rebecca, so I turn around and it's him. And he's healthy and he's doing well and he has put on weight and he has a partner with him and he has a baby. And it was, so powerful because he got to experience life. Don't make me cry again. <laughs> he got to experience life outside of addiction, and I I pray for him all the time, and I hope that he's still doing well, and I hope that his baby girl grows up and, and sees how far he's come. Well, you know, I say it over again. I will never vote for anyone that doesn't have compassion. I mean, you are the role model, really. I I can't I can't believe even you know fostering children to reach out and take children in. That's really uh, wonderful of you, and that, uh, in the cases that you've had, I don't know, uh, some of them, and I don't know the results, that's what I always want to know, what's the end of the story? I mean, you had someone, uh, the uh, Grant Headley, mm -hmm. yeah, um, uh, well, I know, but why don't you tell us about that? So that was the case, I mean, that was the case that I was uh, assistant clerk magistrate for, and I actually included that case in my in my application because that happened during the pandemic, the trial itself. And as you all know, we were um, poor. And we were working while everyone was at home, and we were really we needed continuity of the court and of cases. And, um, we really pulled together. It was such a wonderful experience to be a part of. It wasn't just us, the judiciary and the clerks and everybody else, but it was the court officers and everyone else who just stepped in and. Um, Distinguished Judge Peter Krupp behind me um, and I went over to the Mokley, who lent us their facilities and, and allowed us to conduct our first trials during the pandemic, you know, respecting social distancing and all of that. And we had it was a quick learning curve. We had to learn all of the electronics and all of the, uh, you know, all of the devices that they have. Um, that we this don't. particular person, but that person involved with just yeah. about everything, tend to uh, cocaine. Yeah. yeah, it was a tough case. It was a tough case, and it was tried by really experienced litigants. And the case is actually now back before the court because of recent case law having to do with um, possession of a firearm and things of that sort. But um, it was impactful, and it, it and it was tried very well by two very experienced um, attorneys. Um, it involved, like as you said, very serious allegations of someone shooting at police officers, and um, someone who had um, other involvement with the court. So it was important that we try it um, in a timely manner because he was in custody. And so I appreciate the court really prioritizing that case as one of our first cases to go to the Mowgli Courthouse. And I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of it. And now I'm dealing, you know, helping or I, uh, um, we have, like I said, post conviction stuff coming back. So we're dealing with some appellate issues and I am very proud and honored to be a part of those conversations and hearings as well. It seems like, you know, um, there's all these drugs involved in, in, you know, in the seventies, there was a war on drugs. Well, we never, we lost that war. We never, uh, got there. Um, you talk about specialty. What's do you think the drug courts, do they have enough, um, uh, help to to reach these people. I mean, we don't have enough places to put them. I know that. But uh, what do you know that with the drug courts? I again, I'm a huge proponent of the drug court. My absolute favorite part is the graduation day. Oh, and I love them. If I'm ever on duty or I'm ever in a court, I, I make it a point to go because having been there as a family member who's concerned for someone who's struggling, being able to celebrate such a big accomplishment is um, not only rewarding to the person who's graduating, but to all of us who get to experience that. I sit in the back with tears in my eyes. I mean, that graduation, I mean, these are people of all ages who have gone through um, <laughs> alcohol and drugs, and they, they've gone through this program, which is wonderful. And now they've got a life, and just to hear them, it, it's just wonderful. Yeah, yeah.
we cry a lot. <laughs> but I, I don't know who started these specialty, uh, but I, I think the veterans is another thing that I think that, you know, they've been overlooked and I'm glad that we do have a specialty because um, they've gone through a lot and they need, they need help coming out. And I'm very angry now that we're not housing them. They shouldn't be on the street. I'm not going to get into that. Okay. So, um, um, so with all your experience. Excuse me one second. If you can wrap it up, you have about 30 seconds left. As you know, we have a busy uh, schedule today. Okay. With, I'm being timed. They, they, they both time. But anyway, I just to wrap it up, I, I just am so happy that you did apply. And um, uh, I think the experience you bring is extraordinary and your life experience. And I always say I look for someone to bring life experience and you have it. I mean, you've gone through, you know, so much of your family. Thank God for your family and that um, you pay back fully. And so I wish you all good luck in your new position because I know you. I, I know that. Um, I can imagine that it would be unanimous. And thank you again. It was such a pleasure to meet with you. It was funny because it was so stuff the way we met, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it as thank well. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Uh, I don't have any questions. We had a lengthy conversation on the telephone. Uh, you answered all my questions. Uh, you did a great job today. Your testimony was compelling. Your witnesses were very impressive. Uh, and when your name comes before the council, uh, either next week or the week after, I'm not sure of the schedule, I'd be more than happy to put your name forward. At this point, before we conclude, is there anyone in opposition to the nomination? Hearing no one in opposition, we will conclude the meeting. And thank you, everyone, for coming today. Thank you.